Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Laura and today we are going to be returning to the topic of the satanic panic and talking about Michelle Remembers. Now, I don't actually have a copy of Michelle Remembers because the book is out of print, thankfully. Uh, but I, I have such emotion talking about this book that I feel like I, I need to brandish a book as a prop. So we're just gonna pretend that I have a copy. I wasn't gonna pay the like 50 to $60 that buying a copy requires on amazon.com. So anyway, this book, <laughs> oh boy, it's a doozy. Uh, I touched on this on my last video about the Satanic Panic, and we're going to dive into some of the claims that this book has, and then just really explain how it sparked or maybe, you know, grew the spark of the Satanic Panic into a burning inferno that engulfed the 1980s and early 90s in Satanic conspiracy theories. So for those of you who are not aware, Michelle Remembers was a book published in 1980, and it follows Michelle, the main character, as she goes through therapy with her therapist, Dr. Lawrence Pazder. And Dr. Pazder compiled about 600 hours of audio tapes, which he used to write this book with Michelle. So what essentially ends up happening is that Michelle had gone to him as her therapist for about three to four years, worked through some childhood issues, and then had gone back to him after suffering a few miscarriages. There's a kind of inciting incident one day where Michelle apparently felt something bad and then just screamed and cried for 25 minutes straight, and this started their embarkment into trying to uncover what was wrong with Michelle. And this led Dr. Pazder to, um, a lot of people have uh, hypothesized, used hypnosis on Michelle. That was not confirmed in the book, but it's pretty clear from a lot of the things that she says or the way things were described in the books, like Michelle going into her depths or resurfacing. It's clear that he's, he's putting her in some type of deep trance state to get all of these claims from her. Now you might be thinking, in a hypnotic state, someone is very suggestible and just kind of might create a lot of things through association or prompts from their therapist, and you would be right. You'd be very right. <laughs> a lot of people think that's what this book is. Basically, Michelle believed it was true in the moment and Dr. Pazder somehow believed it was true, but you know, this, this well-meaning, very Catholic therapist just kind of prompted her into creating these wild and fantastic scenarios of abuse. The book became extremely popular and the pair went all across the United States promoting it, which is why all of these ideas of satanic ritual abuse popped up all over the country because they'd just gone and, and spread the ideas like wildfire. They got $100,000 for the advance for the book, and this is 1980s money, and then an additional $242,000 for the paperback copies, different rights, and the potential for a movie deal. However, the book was never made into a movie because someone put forth the intent to sue if it was made into a movie, so that never happened. And all of that money today is over $1.1 million, so they made a very pretty penny off of this endeavor. So what was so crazy in this book that it made everyone believe that their next door neighbor could be a Satanist? Let's find out. I'm going to start with a Goodreads review that uh, talks about some of the hysterical claims or testimony as Dr. Pazder calls it. Number one, the Satanists had a seemingly endless supply of dead babies and white kittens at their disposal to use in their rituals. Number two, in one traumatic ceremony, the Satanists each had a white kitten which they tore apart with their teeth. Number three, Michelle was given away by her mother in an elaborate death rebirth ceremony taking place in a cemetery. Her mother threw her into an open grave and an evil satanic nurse pulled her out and reenacted Michelle's rebirth complete with blood, simulated childbirth, and being licked like a cat. Number four, her tormentors apparently put bugs in her food, which resulted in Michelle's refusal to eat, and she was locked up in a hollow Satan statue and was told she had to eat pieces of the dead baby they smeared on her. Uh, and now this abuse went on for over a year, so you would imagine that if she wasn't eating anything for over a year, she would have died, but apparently this was not the case. 
Number five, an evil church pew mysteriously appears in a Catholic church. Michelle, Dr. Pastor, and a priest have to burn it. Oh, that part was really funny. They show up in a church and there's this mysterious pew with the, these carvings on it. And the priest is like, I don't recognize that, but I do recognize those symbols. They're satanic. We should get rid of it. It's very weird. <laughs> Number six, an evil doctor cuts up a bunch of dead bodies, which apparently leave a bunch of blood everywhere, which is also implausible because after a certain point of time, dead bodies don't bleed, but whatever. And then he surgically sewed horns and a tail onto Michelle. Number seven, all of the dead babies. Number eight, a possessed woman from Vancouver has the ability to spin her head all the way around like Linda Blair in The Exorcist. Then later, a whole room full of Satanists spin their head around like some type of choreographed dance number from hell. Number nine, Satan is a poet and he didn't even know it. Throughout this whole last part of the book, Michelle recites her own type of satanic verses where everything that Satan says is a rhyme. And so there's a little example here, like 28 is the number that opens the gate. And they're, they're very bad rhymes, but God bless her, she just kept going. Number 10, Satan wraps his tail around Michelle's neck and she suffers body memory rashes when she's in her 20s. Number 11, a prepubescent girl is brought out on a cross and Satan cuts out her heart and cleaves her body in half. Number 12, the Archangel Michael, Jesus Christ himself and the Virgin Mary help Michelle survive the several days long satanic ceremony. And the Virgin Mary eventually heals her of all of these wounds, which is the explanation as to why there was no physical evidence on a five-year-old's body of, you know, having, uh, horns and a tail sewed onto her. So I'm going to read a bit from an article now called The Things That Go Bump in Victoria that was written in 1980 as a bit of a response to the book. They also interviewed members of Michelle's family so that you guys can see at least contemporaneously that there were some people who did not believe these claims even though the vast, vast majority of stuff in this book went unchecked. And again, it's kind of it's hard to fact check the devil. It just is. So people just believed it if they were more inclined to believe those things. So here we go. Um, the book is billed as the true account of a five-year-old girl who in the demure mid-1950s, amid the placid charm of Victoria, British Columbia, became the victim of unspeakable practices perpetuated by a band of serious Satanists, among them her mother. Now, I believe I forgot to mention when Michelle and Dr. Pazder start this regression hypnosis therapy in 1976, they surmise that she is regressing to her five-year-old self. And um, I believe the way that Dr. Pazder comes to this realization is that she sounds like a five-year-old when she's recounting these things. So that that's what they go with, this whole thing. They, they believe that it's set in 1954 because that's when she was five. So Michelle says the devil worshippers tried to kill her in a car accident rigged to cover up a murder and then fed her the ashes of the murder victim. They held her in a cage with snakes slithering over her, burned and butchered stillborn babies and fetuses in front of her, surgically attached horns to her head and a tail to her spine, and that was just for the opener. At the end of 310 pages, plucky little Michelle has seen hell and a rhyme spout in Satan. At one point, he has hairy legs and funny toenails and finally defeats the devil through the personal intercession of the Virgin Mary and Jesus himself. What's very interesting about this was the involvement of the Catholic Church. Michelle and Dr. Pastor actually went to the Vatican and met with a couple bishops. One bishop is even quoted in the book as saying, it may well be that for people today to hear this message coming from a five-year-old child is of particular significance. Last week, while patient and doctor were in Seattle at the end of a month-long 30,000 kilometer promotion tour around the US, Smith's relatives and family friends were surfacing to question key facts and reveal interesting omissions in her story. Her mother died of cancer in 1964, but her estranged father, who prefers to remain anonymous as he is in the book, denies that his wife was ever involved in anything satanic and said, I can refute the whole bloody thing right down the line. Diane Lockyer, a doctor's wife whose daughter befriended Michelle when she was nine, describes the girl's mother as a woman whose whole life was for her children and nothing else. You couldn't have a nicer, more charming person. And this is something that has upset Tertia, Michelle's sister, because nobody seems to have brought that forth. The book not only fails to point out that the children adored their mother, as Lockyer puts it, but it also doesn't mention that Michelle had two sisters, Tertia, older than Michelle, 
and Cheryl Younger, facts that if included would have left a reader wondering how the mother kept her other two daughters ignorant of the tortures her supposedly devilish colleagues were inflicting on Michelle during three months in 1954 and 1955. Nor is there any acknowledgement that both Dr. Pastor, a Polish Catholic, and Michelle Smith, who was baptized a Catholic during her psychiatric sessions, have since divorced their spouses, a step frowned upon by the church, and one that seems at odds with the book's celebration of the Catholic version of holiness. And yes, after they divorced their spouses, they married each other. So Michelle's story starts in 1954 when she claims to have been at a Satanist's orgy in Victoria, where she grabbed a bottle to hit a lump under her mother's skirt, um, and the lump turned out to be a woman who was then clubbed to death under the fists of other participants. A malevolent man nicknamed Malachi put the dead woman in a car with Michelle in the back seat and sent it rolling down a mountain road, but somehow the girl survived this flaming crash. A relative recalls that Michelle drove up the same highway with her family when she was about five and saw a woman lying in the road after a traffic accident, a sight that made Michelle extremely hysterical. The story heats up with Satanists deciding to steep the girl in evil for an encounter with the devil when he appears for his Feast of the Beast in 1955. Her mother gives her away to another woman who makes her defecate on the Bible and entombs her in a grave before Michelle is imprisoned in a spider-ridden effigy of the devil, has horns and tail sewed onto her, and witnesses kittens being killed and corpses cut up. Through it all, this five-year-old instinctively knows that the Bible and the crucifix are her weapons. A fiery Satan arrives for his black mass where a man is slaughtered and Michelle sees hell. There's people with no eyes and they're bleeding from their eyes. There's people that got no noses. But just in time, she is visited by the Virgin Mary and her son, who reassure Michelle that she's strong enough to survive. And the devil tells his followers, It's your mistake. You'll have to pay. I give her back. You can't give her away. See what I mean about the rhymes? Michelle is allowed to go home with her mother, and she forgets everything she has seen, conveniently locking away these memories until they're revealed by Dr. Pastor. And they decide to write a book, which even their U.S. publishers, Congdon and Latte, Inc., admit there are a lot of skeptical people as well as there probably should be. Oh, and by the way, for the film version of this that never happened, they wanted Dustin Hoffman to play Lawrence Pastor. So that's an overall description of some of the events that happen in this book. And now let's get a little bit towards the debunking of all of these things, the things that we do know categorically could not have happened for one reason or another. There have been several books and articles that were written debunking the events in Michelle Remembers, including a 1955 book that found no newspaper record of the supposed car crash that the book describes in the time frame, um, despite the fact that at this time the local newspaper reported on all vehicle accidents in the area. Former neighbors, teachers, and friends were interviewed and yearbooks from Smith's elementary school were reviewed and found no indication of Smith being absent from school or missing for lengthy periods of time, including the alleged 81-day non-stop ceremony. Ultimately, the book's authors were unable to find anyone who knew Smith during the 1950s who could corroborate the details of any of her allegations. Another 2002 article explored the unlikeliness of Smith's allegations, among other things. It noted that it seemed unlikely that a sophisticated cult that had secretly existed for generations could be outwitted by a five-year-old, that the cult could hold rituals in the Ross Bay Cemetery unnoticed given that Smith claimed she was screaming, and given that the Ross Bay ceremony is surrounded on three sides by residential neighborhoods, and that an 81-day non-stop ceremony involving hundreds of participants and a massive round room could have gone on in Victoria unnoticed, and that none of Smith's tormentors other than her mother have ever been identified, especially given that some of them apparently had to cut off one of their middle fingers in a black mass. This article also confirms that Michelle was attending school during this supposed 81-day ritual with no remarkable absences and no apparent signs that she was being abused. And like many authors, this one also points out that many of Smith's so-called recovered memories appear to have represented elements of popular culture at the time like the Satanist's head spinning all the way around like in The Exorcist. There's also just a lot of weird racism involving West African traditions because Dr. Pazder worked there for a while, and it seems like he may have unintentionally guided Michelle into parroting some of these experiences. You can say like, oh, 
Did the person have a knife for you on a table? Did this happen? Did that happen? And then she just had to say yes. And so he seems to have taken a lot of these traditions from West Africa that he saw as, you know, satanic in some way and just applied them to this. So we talked a little bit about the aftermath of all of this in a broader sense with the satanic panic in the 1980s. But after this book was published, what was the direct result on the lives of Dr. Pazder and Michelle Smith? We've got at least an example here of what happened to Dr. Pazder. Uh, with the sudden emergence of satanic ritual abuse cases in the 1980s, likely due in part to the publication of Michelle Remembers, Pazder's experience was called upon. In 1984, Pazder acted as a consultant in the McMartin Preschool trial, which featured allegations of satanic ritual abuse. Pazder also appeared on the first major news report on Satanism, broadcast May 16, 1985, by ABC's 2020. Pazder was part of the Cult Crime Impact Network and lectured to police agencies about satanic ritual abuse during the late 1980s. And by 1987, Pazder reported that he was spending a third of his time consulting on satanic ritual abuse cases. With people suddenly being prosecuted for satanic ritual abuse, prosecutors also used the book as a guide when preparing cases against alleged Satanists. It's also interesting that early on, uh, Dr. Pazder claimed that it was the Church of Satan doing all these terrible things to Michelle, um, and then he was threatened with a lawsuit by Anton LaVey, the founder of the Church of Satan, which was founded in 1966, and these things took place supposedly in 1954, so that doesn't even make sense. It seems to me that Dr. Pazder truly did not understand all of the damage that he and Michelle did with Michelle Remembers. There was an interview with him from the Mail on Sunday in 1990, I believe, where he was asked, does it matter if it was true or is the fact that Michelle believed it happened to her the most important thing? He replied, yes, that's right. It is a real experience. If you talk to Michelle today, she will say, that's what I remember. We still leave the question open. For her, it was very real. Every case I hear about, I have skepticism. You have to complete a long course of therapy before you can come to conclusions. We are all eager to prove or disprove what happened, but in the end, it doesn't matter. Here's the thing. It does matter what you publish in a book that affects the lives of thousands of people across the United States. Many people were put in jail or wrongly accused of things that ruined their lives that they categorically did not do. So yes, it does matter if what you are saying is true. So many people's lives were ruined by Michelle Remembers and it's not enough to just say, it was a true experience for Michelle and the rest doesn't matter to me. Another thing about Michelle Remembers is that as time went on, the claims had to get you know bigger and bigger and crazier for it to remain interesting. So I have another article here that says, you know, as the sessions wore on, the remembering grew more dramatic, detailed, and overtly paranormal. While she was at first merely an unwilling participant in satanic rituals, Michelle claimed she was eventually kidnapped by a group that the pair would come to identify as a Victoria-based satanic cult. Each session with Pazder built on the horror of the one before, eventually becoming so nightmarish that the therapist brought in priests to offer blessings and benedictions to protect Michelle from the evil of her own memory. Eventually, Michelle says that she was saved by the miraculous intervention of Jesus and the Virgin Mary, who appeared to her in the midst of a satanic ritual. Taken together, the book's claims seem so extraordinary and its evidence so thin that it becomes difficult to imagine anyone believing Michelle's utterances to be literally true. And indeed, Michelle remembers central claims can be debunked with even the most cursory investigation. What's pretty awful about this too is that Michelle was kind of being traumatized about the things that she was remembering in this hypnosis. So there were a lot of times near the end where she talked to Dr. Pazder about wanting to stop and he, he didn't let them. She wanted to stop therapy and he said, no, we have to keep going which is not what a therapist should do at all. I've also got a lot here from the point of view of Kenneth Lanning, who was kind of an expert in the field of child essay. He was a top expert in the FBI and consulted on many cases during this time. Apparently in 1983, he received a call from a police officer. Uh, an adult woman had come forward alleging that she had been recently essayed by a satanic cult and forced to participate in rituals that involved animal sacrifice and shadowy rituals. 
And Lanning said that I'd heard pieces of cases like this, but I had never heard it all together like this. Lanning and the officer discussed investigative approaches. A conspiracy like this would require rooting out a rat who could turn the others. Fortunately for any investigators trying to build a case, a cult that had sacrificed humans and drank their blood probably would have left a lot of evidence around. So Lanning remembered putting down the phone thinking, I'll never hear a case like this again. Two weeks later, he got another call. It was a second investigator with allegations that were so similar that at first Lanning thought he was speaking to the first guy, although this was an entirely different case. Then more and more and more calls like this came in until Lanning suddenly found himself consulting on dozens of cases of supposed satanic ritual abuse. Lanning eventually found that these cases fell into several different categories. The first were very similar to Michelle's claims, adults, usually women, who were living highly successful, functional lives, when they sought therapists to deal with issues like anxiety and depression, and then through therapy, they would discover elaborate memories of cult-driven SA. Almost all of these cases, it would be later discovered, could be traced to a group of therapists who bought into the since-debunked methods of using hypnosis-like techniques to recall false memories of sexual trauma. In fact, this is apparently something that even Freud did over a hundred years ago, and he at first thought that he was successful in uncovering cases of trauma, but then when women kept telling even more and more fantastic tales, he even realized that, you know, this is not true. So seminars on identifying and investigating satanic ritual abuse became common throughout North America, where Michelle and Dr. Pazder were frequent guests. Pazder was an unbelievably intelligent man who was extremely skeptical of almost all of the other cases of satanic ritual abuse, except his own and a few others, said Lanning, who attended one of these conferences in the 1980s. Pazder told the assembled officers that he could spot valid cases involving true intergenerational satanic cults from hoaxes and mere teenage rebellion. Lanning, intrigued, recalls taking about 40 pages of notes throughout the presentation until he began to notice something odd. Police officers would ask Michelle a question about her experience and Pazder would answer for her. Lanning piped up and said, I'm curious, these are all things that happened to Michelle, but you seem to be answering all of the details. Pazder responded that Michelle no longer retained any memory of the events after she recounted them in her full therapy sessions. Her brain had locked them back up again, and now I'm the keeper of the story, apparently, Pazder said. In response to this, Lanning said, I immediately put down my pen and didn't take another note. Pazder, meanwhile, would continue to talk on behalf of his new wife for years to come. The same Mail on Sunday reporter who in 1990 talked to Michelle's family was denied access to Michelle herself by Pazder. He said that for Michelle to go on talking about these things is too painful. She is totally free of Satan today. So for Lanning, these calls that began in 1983 continued for almost a decade, tale after tale, each one mimicking the one before. But these similarities did not convince Lanning that these stories were real. In fact, the nearly identical natures of the stories made him even more skeptical, almost like everyone was looking at some sort of script. So Lanning saw all of this. He watched as the impossible testimonies of women and children coalesced into a conspiracy, a movement, and then a full-blown moral panic. If people could believe this, he thought they could believe anything. Just as Michelle's rememberings began as mundane flashes of creepy wrongdoing and grew into outright paranormal visions, so too did the claims of the satanic panic grow more and more elaborate and implausible. I mean, if you think about it, if all of the men, women, and children who claim to have experienced satanic ritual abuse were to be believed, then Satanists had to have been murdering tens of thousands of people every year. Lanny noted that bodies never showed up, nor did any physical evidence of animal sacrifice or fetal remains or anything to prove any of these claims. And with all of this being said, I just want to end on the fact that a lot of what Michelle experienced really was based on her own trauma. There was a lot that she was dealing with based on having miscarried. And I think a lot of that you can see in the text as well, especially when she's talking about babies. That's all that I have to say about Michelle Remembers and the Satanic Panic. There is so much more that I could do, but this video is so much longer than I originally intended already. Let me know any questions you guys have in the comments below, any weird stories you've heard, anything like that. I hope you all have a great day and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.